Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's event, Dear Dumpling Stories and Cooking Tips for Lunar New Year, with Wendy from Happy Woman Kitchen and Dixon and Pearl from Dickie's Dumps. Tonight, we have a very special host, uh, Leanne Young from CBC Vancouver will be joining us. So we're gonna get started in a few minutes. We're just opening up the Zoom room right now and we can see there's a lot of people here, which is great. Super happy to have you here. So uh, get cozy and, uh, and we're gonna have some fun this uh, Lunar New Year, this pandemic Lunar New Year. There's lots of great upcoming events. We've got uh, some in, uh, Indigenous Storyteller in Residence events. Our Indigenous Storyteller this year is Kung JD. And uh, as you can see, we've got events coming up on the 18th and 23rd. And then also Kari uh, McClellan is gonna be here on the 25th and he's gonna be doing some uh, slave freedom songs. So those will be happening on, on that day from seven to 8 p.m. Hello everyone and welcome to Dear Dumpling, we're super happy to have you here tonight. Uh, we are celebrating uh, Lunar New Year at the Vancouver Public Library with a very special event tonight. So in, in the chat box, we'd love to know where you are watching this from. So please, uh, please put it in the chat and we can see who's here. Salmon Arm, Vancouver, the best. What, Vegas, Chicago, Australia? Are you guys serious? This is amazing. East Van, of course. Great. The West End is the best end, I have to say. So hello everyone and welcome to Dear Dumpling Stories and Cooking Tips for Lunar New Year. We're gonna get started in a few minutes. We're just letting uh, people into the room. There's still a lot of people coming in. So if you'd like to, please let us know where you are watching this from in the chat window. Strathcona. Downtown East Side, excellent. Thank you for joining us tonight. UBC, awesome. Kelowna, this is great. What, China, excellent. Thank you, Saskatoon, love it. Marpole, excellent. West Fan, shout out North Fan, Burnaby. This is so great. Thank you all for joining us tonight. We are super excited for this event. Uh, we're gonna get started in a few minutes. We're just letting people into the room. We're um, still have a lot of people coming in, which is great. Please feel free to let us know where you're joining us from in the chat box on the right-hand window. And we are gonna have a Q&A tonight as well. So get your questions ready. And there's on the very bottom of your Zoom screen, there's a Q&A box. Yeah, we're all hungry. I hear you, Timothy. Um, yes, and, and the Q&A uh, will happen at the end of the evening. We're gonna take a few short questions, but uh, we're super happy to see everyone here tonight. So we're gonna get started in a few minutes. There's still quite a few people coming in and we all love dumplings. I tell you, I agree. We are going to record, we are recording this event tonight and uh, we will be finding a spot for it somewhere soon and we'll, uh, we'll let you guys know on social media where that's going to be. Burlington, nice. Must be getting kind of late on the East Coast. What are we, three hours ahead? So we're around 10 o'clock over there. That's great. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay, we're still getting a few people into the room. We don't want anybody to sort of miss out on everything. So we'll get started in a couple of minutes. We're at 7.04 now, so we'll give it another minute or so and then we'll get started. So if you're just coming into the room, we're super excited to uh, have you with us tonight. <laughs> We'd love to have samples for sure. Real life samples one day. Um, but let us know where you're joining us from. We've got people from all over the world here, uh, which is amazing. I even saw someone put in Australia. We've got someone from China, Richmond, great. Uh, we had East Van, of course. We've got uh, West End, 
um, and Marpole area, all parts of the different lower mainland. Houston, Texas, Americans are welcome. UBC, excellent. Thank you so much. Montreal, I've never heard of Teotaki, uh, Montreal. That's great, thank you for joining us. I'm sure I'm probably saying that wrong. We're just letting the few more people in the room. So we'll get started in another couple of minutes. There still seems to be quite a few people coming in, which is great. Uh, tonight, we, you are at Dear Dumpling and get ready for some great stories. We've got uh, some cooking demos for you. We've got uh, Dixon and Pearl from Dickie's Dumps. We've got Wendy from Happy Woman Kitchen. And of course, our CBC Vancouver host tonight is Leanne Young. And we are super excited. So we're gonna get started in a couple minutes. Just uh, let uh, a few more people into the room. Okay, I think we're ready to go. And as people kind of come in, they'll sort of um, just catch the tail end of the intro, which is fine. So we'll get started now. Okay, great. So welcome everyone. And uh, I'm Candy Tanaka. I work in the programming and learning department at the Vancouver Public Library. And I'm super happy to have you uh, with us today. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we're on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And we'd just like to take a moment out of our day to think about what that really means and sort of, you know, think about that as we move about the land. So a few quick notes for our format today. If you are having any technical issues or would like to give some digital applause, what you can do is you can put that in the chat window just on your right hand side. You can also give some shout outs. Anything you see that you're like super happy that's going on, just let us know. And also, if you want to put, uh, put any questions in the Q&A box, it's just right at the bottom of your screen there. We're going to have a short uh, Q&A at the end of the evening, and uh, I, I'm hoping we're going to have some time for that. And just like our in-person events, please be mindful and respectful of everyone here. Okay, so we're going to get started. Uh, I am super happy to have been uh, pulled in to help organize this event. It started off with Diane and Jorge. I went away on holidays. I came back and they said, hey, you're going to be doing a dumpling event. And I'm like, perfect. So I pulled in a couple of uh, great people that I saw online and thought they would be perfect for this. Uh, Wendy, I know in person, but I'm super happy to have the, this event going on. Uh, and I'm going to give you a little story. When I was a young child and growing up in Tawasson, which is way out near the ferry terminal, uh, my uh, grandfather and grandmother on my mother's side, they used to come to visit us at, at uh, our family house and they would have these great Chinese uh, food feasts, which was super exciting. So on the weekends, sometimes they would come over and they would cook up this amazing feast for us. We had like broccoli with beef, we had braised curry chicken, we had veggie chow mein, egg foo young, lup chong and rice, and of course, wonton soup. So my uh, grandfather, he would actually uh, basically reel me in to make the wontons. And I love doing the pork wontons. It was like such a, a great time to be able to take a little bit of the, uh, the pork and the chives and put them in a, a little wrapper and then wrap it up, you know, pinch it with a little bit of egg wash and then put it aside for the, um, the soup. So tonight is a super special uh, event for me tonight. I'm super happy to be here. And my grandfather, he actually uh, did a cookbook and in the cookbook is actually a wonton recipe. This is like from years and years ago, but his cookbook is called The Fabulous Chinese Cookbook. Uh, it's out of print basically, but uh, he did he did a, you know, a little wonton recipe in there. So that's my little story. So I am super stoked tonight to be able to introduce CBC Vancouver superstar Leanne Young. She is with us tonight, taking a short break from looking after a tiny human to host the evening for us. Leanne is the award-winning multimedia host and producer of CBC Vancouver News on Saturdays and Sundays, and is passionate about telling stories of Metro Vancouver's diverse communities. She's a big fan of Vancouver's culinary scene and will be talking dumplings and Lunar New Year traditions with us tonight. And a big shout out to Pearl and Dixon for connecting us all together. So thanks for joining us, Leanne. How has your evening been so far? Thank you, Candy. It's been going really well. I mean, you can't really go wrong talking about dumplings, can you? And uh, what a lovely story that you shared with your family, um, making dumplings with your, your grandparents. And, you know, unfortunately, I never had the chance to really make dumplings with my family. I guess we're, um, where my family is based on the on my father's side, we, we 
didn't really have a history of making dumplings and on my mom's side was Shanghainese. And so there are Shanghainese dumplings, which is kind of what you're gonna see from Pearl and Dickie. That's probably why I love their dumplings so much. My aunt and uncle make them once in a while and they're delicious, but my memory with dumplings is uh, always over dim sum. It's, I mean, it's usually just a dumpling feast. So I, I absolutely love it. Um, but thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this. I'm really excited to be here today. I have a chance to speak with everyone, a chance to speak with Wendy and yourself and with uh, Pearl and Dixon. Um, and as you mentioned, yes, I am on a little bit of a uh, hiatus from work to do a, I would say, what I have learned uh, is an even harder job as a mom, my little one. You might hear him squealing there in the background. Uh, we're all in the uh, in the kitchen right now. So um, excuse me if, if I do have to run over and, and soothe him or something, but my husband's got him. So very excited to be here today and then chat with everyone about uh, dumplings. And I can't believe the amount of people we have. Well, there's lots of people on there online right now with all of us, over 200. And the, where you guys are from is very cool. Chicago, Australia, where else did we see? Houston, Montreal, unbelievable. Uh, makes East Van, where I am, seem very, very boring. All right. <laughs> uh, so I wanted to introduce our two guests this evening. I'm going to start first with uh, Wendy. So um, you can see her, her picture right now. There she is. Hi, Wendy. So I'm going to give first a little bit of a, of a bio if you uh, haven't uh, read it yet through the uh, registration page. So our first introduction of the evening is Wendy Ao Young. Wendy is a Hong Kong Chinese Canadian settler who has been living life and sharing meals with the Chinatown, Strathcona, downtown Eastside community for over five years. Her early love for food and cooking has evolved in a life of nurturing community and connecting unlikely people around the table in different cultural contexts and places. Happy Woman Kitchen is just one expression of her desires to welcome people over food, work towards justice, and be a bridge builder across cultures. Happy Woman Kitchen is a social enterprise. She's trying to create accessible opportunities for women in the Strathcona, Chinatown, and downtown Eastside communities with refugee and immigrant backgrounds. And it allows for them to share their cooking talents and provide for their families and be equipped with business skills as the Vancouver chapter of their story unfolds. So welcome, Wendy. I'd also like to invite our other guests to turn their cameras on now from Dickie's Dump. So good friends of mine. Hello, hi, Pearl. And Dickie's just scooted off there, he's back. All right, uh, let me introduce you to the duo behind Dickie's Dumps. They're delivering handmade Chinese dumplings across Vancouver. Dixon and Pearl are both Hong Kong born, longtime Vancouverites. Together and separately, they have been championing community and culture for most of their adult lives. Uh, Dixon through cooking and feeding loved ones and Pearl through creating District Local as a Vancouver passion project. Dickie's Dumps was conceived as a District Local Lunar New Year event. It was an art show, I believe, right, Pearl? Yeah, and uh, celebrating Chinese heritage while bringing the community together and sharing culture in a fun way with those who may or may not have grown up with it, which is perfect for tonight. They are looking forward to spending more time connecting with people through in-person events that feed their souls, fostering community, and using dumplings as a conversation starter. Welcome to the three of you. How are you all doing today? Hello, hello. Hi, nice to see you. Yeah, so excited. So um, I think for all of our attendees, you are all in for a treat because you're going to see um, there's already a second shot there in the camera with uh, Dixon and Pearl's kitchen set up. So we're going to get a demo there. And Wendy also has some dumplings with her. Ta-da! And she is going to be doing a demo for us as well. And we're going to hear some stories and just talk about Lunar New Year and celebrate being being Asian, it's the best. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah let's do this. Yeah. And of course, the uh, the chat is live. So uh, if you guys have comments, if you want to have, if you have questions, feel free to fire them away. And there is a Q and A function as well, so you can ask your questions there. And of course, that uh, we'll 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 drop into the chat to make sure everybody's uh, all part of this conversation that we're having. So first of all, um, I think uh, part of the event is trying to figure out a little bit about the history of dumplings. Do either of you guys, any of you guys know the history of, of dumplings in China? Um, who wants to go Wendy? first? <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, if you don't know, I've got it here. So I can, we, I can, we have an yeah, idea. I'll, I'll take it idea. away. All right, yeah. I'll take it away. Yeah. So it. A, a bit of research has been done. And um, so apparently dumplings, well, legend has it. Oh my goodness, what am I? I'm trying to, I've got my iPad here and my best friend here is is pinging me, not aware that I am live in the middle of yeah. this. And I don't know how to turn off the notifications in a hurry. So I'm going to just leave it. Oh, look, my husband's running over to try and rescue me. I mean, this is exactly <laughs> what a Zoom is like, right? It's all about- <laughs> Especially, you know, a Chinese unexpected New Unexpected surprises. Yeah. Right, I know. This is like from home. Okay, so uh, I believe the history of dumplings so according to at least one legend, it stems from the Han dynasty. So this is more than, I believe, 1800 years ago. And there was a man named Zheng Chongqing. I'm, I'm Cantonese. I'm not quite sure how to say it in Mandarin. It's Zheng Chongqing, I think that's his name. And he's believed to actually be um, a Chinese medicine practitioner. So he was a Chinese doctor. And he had gone back to his village and he actually had seen that a lot of people had frostbitten ears. And so, you know, in traditional Chinese uh, medicine and foods, um, if you eat certain foods, it helps actually uh, create, restore your chi and gives you I guess more internal heat. My mom always says like eat hay or, or like that kind of idea. And so he actually took some mutton, um, which is lamb and chilies and some traditional Chinese herbs and he stuffed them into scraps of dough. And he ended up feeding them to uh, people in his village around Lunar New Year. And lo and behold, the next day, people felt like that their frostbitten ears were, were resolved, were fixed. Now we don't know if that's entirely true or not, but we do know that they ended up loving the taste of these dumplings and they started eating them all the time around Lunar New Year and so that is believed to be the uh, the legend of dumplings but the history of dumplings like there's actually archaeological fact that uh, actually extends back to I believe the Tang Dynasty so that's about 1400 years ago um, archaeologists have actually found traces of images of dumplings um, in, in uh, some of their findings so goes back a very long time. And that's of course, just dumplings in China because you have dumplings all around the world. There's just so many different cuisines that all do dumplings. All right, now that we're all briefed on the history of dumplings in China, I wanna learn a little bit more about what the three of you do. So I'm gonna start with you, Wendy. So Happy Woman Kitchen, I gave a little bit of a brief about what it is, but you tell us, what's, what's your story? How did it all come to be? Yeah. Um... I started Happy Woman Kitchen a few years ago as an extension of my work with a nonprofit in the downtown Eastside area called Servant Partners, um, engaging in community organizing and leadership development. And like Leanne mentioned, um, my hope is to empower women with refugee and immigrant backgrounds in the area uh, to use their cooking skills as a way to support their families, um, gain some professional experience, and participate in their new community in Strathcona, Chinatown, downtown Eastside, Vancouver area. So how it started was um, I think maybe three summers ago. Uh, I'm also on a planning team for another local event called the Strathcona Artisan Market, which is um, a low barrier craft market uh, aimed, to providing, um, aimed at providing opportunities for artisans in the downtown Eastside area to have an opportunity to showcase their work. So I was um, in charge of recruiting food vendors for our event. So the first person I thought of was Kong Tai, Mrs. Kwong, which is um, a Chinatown elder. Um, and we have known each other by then for a few years. Uh, we first met through um, community organizing in Chinatown and attending protests together. And at one point, me and some friends from church were hosting a tea party, uh, like tea, weekly tea events at her building. So we were really close by then. So I was like, Kong Tai needs to sell her dumplings at the artisan market. But, you know, as an elder, there's a lot to navigate around um, how to do it on a mass scale. So I went alongside her to support her and um, being someone that also loves to cook and bake, I also made a few items myself. And uh, yeah, one day I was just like, well, maybe I'll like brand it and see what happens. So I thought of a name and printed some business cards, started an Instagram, and it kind of just took off from there. Um, after the artisan market, we had a few more opportunities to do uh, pop-ups at um, other community events, um, partnering with 
um, groups like the Vancouver Asian Film Festival and YCC, which is youth, youth Collaborative in Chinatown, the group that does the outdoor Mahjong socials. So um, yeah, we've been really grateful to have these community connections and partnerships. And then the year after I extended the invitation to my Syrian friend who also lives in the community, her name is Wella, to join us as an assistant. And a few months later, after helping out at different pop-ups, she also wanted to try selling Syrian food. So that's kind of how, um, why we also have a selection of Syrian treats um, on our menu. And yeah, that, that's that's the short history. It's all just kind of serendipitous. It just happened organically, it sounds like. Very nice. And so um, Pearl and Dixon, Dickie's Jumps, you guys also have a bit of a history in Chinatown, right? Because that's essentially kind of where you guys got started as well. 100%. And um, growing up here, up I pretty much spent every Saturday in Chinatown, Chinese school, and that's forced, you know, forced to go to Chinese school. And then we go to a, either Maxim or Boss for, for lunch or Ken's Kitchen. And then afternoon I have Scouts. So that's my Saturday spent 10, I think it was 10 to 12 years, every Saturday in Chinatown while kids are watching cartoons in the morning um, in Chinese school. So hindsight, I'm glad I did that because uh, I'm still fluent in Cantonese and Chinese and um, my parents pushed me to do it. Girl. Yeah, I mean, I think growing up here, we all, we all have fond memories of going to Chinatown. I mean, in hindsight, again, <laughs> it's, it's a fond memory. So as a child, <laughs> not so much fun. Being pushed I, to go to Chinese yeah, school, yeah, yeah, I hear yeah, you. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so like it's, it's kind of nice for us to kind um, and then how the whole bumping thing started was um, because Pearl was running an art show and I'll let her speak on that. Yeah, I think just a few years ago um, through District Local, I was thinking that we could find tangible ways to connect with the community more and also celebrate our heritage. Um, so we put together a Lunar New Year art show inviting local artists um, to create custom art on red envelopes, like, you know, the traditional red pockets for Chinese New Year. Um, so we had the art show at Fortune Sound Club in Chinatown on the uh, Chinese New Year parade day. So lots of people, lots of foot traffic, a lot of people came through, um, probably a, a thousand or two thousand people yeah. came through. Um, and then the next year, we invited Dixon to run a dumpling component to the event, and that was a hit. And ever since then, we've been back every Chinese New Year to uh, host a food dumpling event at, during Chinese New Year. Very cool. And then the pandemic hit, and then that changed things for you, right? It did. It did because um, I actually have a day job too on top of this, and Pretty much the two months that I got laid off, um, the dumplings picked right up and people were just head stocking their freezer. It's gonna be Armageddon. Well, yeah, because of the lockdown, no one wanted to go out. Like, like, everyone was scared to go to, to the supermarkets yeah. and weren't sure what to do. So uh, dumplings to yeah. the rescue. I was a full-time delivery yeah. driver and um, it was surreal driving through the city those first two weeks where there was no mm -hmm. cars Very on quiet, the road. just the dumpling truck. Dumpling <laughs> truck Uber eats, yeah. skip the dishes, yeah. and um, the Fan Tuan people, which is a Chinese yeah. delivery. You're just waving like, at all, all the other delivery so drivers. This, this loop, and then, yeah, so that was, um, yeah, that was. It's, so it's been a year of dumplings, for sure. Yeah, yeah. dumplings to the yeah. rescue. Um, oh, I, is, did you guys hear a lot of that feedback that's coming when I'm when I speak loudly? Is that me? I'm not sure who it is, but uh, oh, I just wanted to bring in a really fun comment from Sue. Sue says, as a kid, I was so jealous of my friends who got to go to Chinese school. My mother sh wasn't sure what to do with me. You want to go to Chinese school, she says, as a blonde, blue eyed Westerner of English background. So, hey, <laughs> Sue, there you go. <laughs> that's the grass is always greener. Yeah, that's the same oh, thing. So grass is greener on the other side. Yeah. Totally. It's funny that it's like, it's such a thing that everyone knows, oh yeah, being forced to go to Chinese school for that. 
All right. So I also want to know from, so Wendy, uh, you are now, I would say like the holder of secrets of dumplings from all of these popos that you work with. So <laughs> what have they taught you as, as you've gone through this process of, you know, both like um, essentially building up a social enterprise and really uh, uh, making something that's so, um, that has so much cultural meaning for people uh, with dumplings. Yeah, um, yeah, I don't think I mentioned, so like Kong Tai is in charge of recruiting her friends to come wrap dumplings with her, which is why we have like team grandma that I like to dub them. And um, yeah, I think they've definitely taught me better wrapping technique. I think maybe uh, the next summer after I started uh, another um, grandma in our group, Ma Tai, Mrs. Ma, she's like, mm, your dumpling technique got better. So uh, hopefully I'll be able to pass on some, uh, some tips to you. Um, yeah, it's been really lovely to work alongside grandmas. And I think what I enjoy the most is, um, yeah, just kind of be able to get to know them a bit more as we chat. Um, sometimes it's a little chaotic because there's Mandarin and Cantonese and then English going on and three grandmas are asking me for something at the same time. So I have to like call myself sometimes. <laughs> um, yeah, but uh, I think I learned a lot about teamwork. Um, and um, yeah, I think I'm also really proud of them because even though they're seniors and really old, they really see this as an opportunity to kind of um, meet the needs that they see in Chinatown today. So kind of with the changing landscape and there being like less and less affordable food options for um, neighborhood residents and Chinese seniors, um, they kind of really see like, Hey, like even if it's a couple of times a year, if we're able to kind of get together and use our skills to um, meet the needs we see in community, that's great. So I really admire them for, um, yeah, their resiliency and yeah, just kind of like owning their skills and being willing to share that with the community. Yeah, I want to know more about that. So what what is their takeaway from all of this? The fact that um, I mean, obviously, they, they, I think most family, a lot of families wrap dumplings for, for their own use and for their loved ones. And now that they're actually selling these to uh, the broader community, and there's a bit of, there's some intercultural kind of exchange there and intergenerational as well uh, within Happy Woman Kitchen. Well, what's their takeaway from all of this? Yeah, I mean, like, I, I really wish, like, this question makes me wish that, like, I was, I would have been able to bring a grandma along, but with COVID, it's just, not great. So I'll try to answer them on your, um, their behalf. Um, yeah. What's their takeaway? I think one, they really value the community connection. So, you know, even though there are like activities going on um, around the neighborhood for seniors, um, I think they just appreciate another opportunity to connect with their friends and do something together and um, yeah, just kind of battle social isolation, I guess. Um, so I think that is big for them. And yeah, and I mean, for me, um, I was surprised that, um, so the, the things that I sold um, at our first pop-up were uh, noodle bowls. Um, I really love noodles. I'm like solidly on the noodle, noodle girl <laughs> instead of rice girl, because I love noodles. And um, uh, these uh, green tea matcha mochi cakes I've been baking since as a teenager. So personally, I was surprised in hindsight that like, oh, like, I chose to offer something from my culture as my first foot forward. And um, yeah, just seeing that be successful was just a lot of you know, a healthy kind of pride that, that came with it. So I really do hope that for the seniors, um, you know, in the face of maybe discrimination or certain experiences that has been difficult for them navigating um, living life in Canada while not speaking English, I. I really do hope that um, seeing, um, yeah, their culture and their food being offered in public and having it um, have rave responses, I, I really hope that they have that kind of like pride for themselves as well. Um, and maybe if in our audience, um, if we're like of Asian background, I think usually um, often we hear our elders say that like, oh, like I'm old and I'm useless, I, I can't do anything, but that's totally not true, right? Like I, I believe that all of us have something different to offer in different seasons. And I'm proud to be able to create like a structure where um, yeah, their gifts and their talents in this season of life, they can, they can share it with the community. So I also hope that 
um, yeah, it's a place where they have gained self-esteem and um, yeah, love for themselves. And like I mentioned, like pride in being Asian and that I am a participant fully in this community, regardless of my age or gender or um, mother tongue, et cetera. Absolutely, and what they've done have uh, has touched a broader community, right? That's so lovely. Um, so Pearl and Dixon, of course, we are here today talking about Lunar New Year, celebrating the Year of the Ox. What are some of the traditions that you guys grew up with in your household and do you still do them now? Yeah, there are, I feel like um, immigrating, it depends on if you came from Hong Kong or different uh, uh, parts of China, you might have different traditions that come with you. And also it depends on, um, say, if your parents have to work and they don't get that kind of week off that you do traditionally in, in Hong Kong, um, it's how much time you have to do these tradition, traditional things. Um, but there are definitely things that we've kept doing, mm -hmm. like, you know, basic things down to wearing red, Right, like wearing red. Yeah. You can <laughs> red. red. We stuck <laughs> it up on our wall. <laughs> right, and um, I saw you guys posted on IG about the Nya Ma So yes. some of that that's one tradition, right? That so um one. You guys translate, you tell you you tell what that tradition is. Okay, so um, Li Nyaba means the 28th eighth day of the month, actually. So it usually represents the last month of the year. And um Basically, that's the day you want to do all your cleaning done for the new year um, to sweep away all the bad luck. Um, and one of the things we we got actually were pomelo leaves. And those, you use that to shower or take a bath in. Look it up on Google for like the actual details. But yeah, you bathe in pomelo leaves and you wash all your bad luck away. Next year, you're the ox. When it's going to come, it's going to be all good luck, all prosper, all money. Wash I mean, all of yes, wealth and health. <laughs> yeah, it's always yeah. about fortune, good health, long life. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, that's something we kept. And then um, I have pretty clear memories of, you know, having my extended family in Hong Kong with all the cousins and the aunties and the uncles and the grandma doing all the dinners, making dumplings during the day and having that as one of the meals. Um, and then obviously don't forget about the red pockets. That's one thing when I moved here, I'm like, oh, what, where's all my red pockets? Where did they go? <laughs> Money for the year. What, what is this Christmas thing? We want my Chinese New Year red pocket. So yeah. that, that's, um, yeah, like we, we, and we kept certain traditions too. It's like things that are easy to do. Um, so yeah. Right, and you know what, I was on a um, call yesterday, and we were talking about that uh, tradition of not cleaning after the 28th day, because you don't want to wash away your good luck. So everyone's like, oh, good thing it's on Zoom, because that means you're not going to shower for the next three days. I'm like, that's right. <laughs> and See, the haircut, look, too. What about the haircut? Pearl oh, yeah, I definitely, one of my annual resets, it's just ingrained into me that I get a haircut shortly before New Year. Just oh. to, again, it's one of those things like cleaning your house, like just getting rid of the, the old year juju. Yeah, 2020. Yeah. Getting to the new year. <laughs> I know we thought 2019 was bad, then 2020 hit us, and we're like, what is going on? So, 2021, mm -hmm. year of the ox, this is going to be the year. Yes. And so, Wendy, what about you? What are your some of your favorite traditions uh, around Lunar New Year? Uh, actually, um, I grew up in Hong Kong, so most of my uh, memories with Chinese New Year. Well, in hindsight, like two thirds of them um, <laughs> are spent in Hong Kong, I guess. Um, and for my family, the um, Lin Sam Sup meal is big. So Lin Sam Sup is the is Chinese New Year's Eve, and traditionally, it's when families and loved ones would gather together to spend um, time and have a meal together. And um, we spend a lot of time with my mom's side of the family. And my mom um, is a great cook. She so she'll cook for, um, our group will be like 15, 20, 20 people. And she'd always cook at least eight things. And um, yeah, so I have memories of helping out and then suggesting what to make. And yeah, one of um, the favorite dishes that she makes is stir fried crab with rice cake. So yeah, everything we eat for this meal has a meaning to it. So rice cake in Cantonese is lingo 
which um, also st stands for the phrase like, may your year be higher. So, may, so it kind of symbolizes like, may your next year improve. Um, we also eat things like shrimp or prawns because in Chinese it's ha, so it's like ha 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 ha, you know? So wishing everyone a year of joy and laughter ahead. Um, what else? Fish. fish, fish is another one. Yeah, yeah fish always is fish yeah. in Cantonese. And it also sounds like the word for excess or abundance. So kind of wishing that for everything one needs or wants in life, that there would be an abundance and excess of it for the next year. So sure. and yeah, food is a big one for me growing up. And yeah, I guess since moving to Canada, um, I've kind of sought to create that um, with the different people I've lived with and spent time with over the years. Um, yeah, I think what Pearl and Dixon mentioned, it's like a matter of like, how much time do you have to do everything? So yesterday I was trying to clean my house, <laughs> up, clean my apartment at the same time yeah. and do some prep for a Zoom meal I'm doing with friends tomorrow and mm -hmm. um, prep for um, our Happy Room Kitchen dessert event this weekend. So I was like, how am I doing like five things in one day? So. Um, <laughs> Yeah, in Canada, I usually try to host um, also like a lean, a lean sounds up like family meal with friends. And yeah, it's been really special over the years to do that in different places in Montreal and Nova Scotia and Vancouver and kind of uh, be able to share our heritage with um, different folks around the table. Um, and also just kind of create a festive environment for myself. Um, I think every year, sometimes I'm like, oh, I got to study for midterms. And then, you know, two days before I text my friend, I'm like, no, we have to do a meal. <laughs> or like, it just doesn't feel right not to do a meal on that day. So I think that's one tradition I've really held fast and reinvented and did it differently over the years. And that's this year it's on Zoom. So what do you know? <laughs> That's right. I mean, absolutely. I think the biggest uh, tradition that I hear from so many of my friends, family, you know, just the broader community around Lunar New Year is always food. And it's just, it's kind of rare to meet a Chinese kid that doesn't say food is a big part of their upbringing, right? Like it's, this is why there's like, if you look up the foodie community in Vancouver, half of them are Chinese. <laughs> like we, we all love food. We all like grew up, yeah. like food is such a central part of um, of the culture, right? I, I just I just say food is our love language for our culture. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. You know, um, I don't know if you guys are part of subtle Asian traits. Um, yeah, of course. Um, but yes, of course, right? And it's, I, I think the meme that I saw, it's basically like you tell your family like, oh yeah, like I like oranges. And then they bring you a thousand oranges. And then like when your family, your mom or your dad like peels it for you, like that's that's the love that's, language. That's right what there. I love yeah. these because you know, they're not going to say it to you and it. you're they probably not going to say I it back you. to them. So not, not <laughs> all my generation. Dad definitely was not going to say it to you. Here's, here's some soup. Here's some stock. Here's, yeah, yeah. you know, that's, that's their I love you. Yeah, I, love you. Yeah, I saw someone mention about the Tong Yun too. I feel like that we should touch on that a little bit because that's a pretty important part because um, technically Tong Yun's a dumpling too. And Tong, yeah, and what Tong Yun's like are. Like a sweet, right? so sweet dumpling. Yeah, mochi balls filled with, um, sometimes going to be black sesame, sometimes going to be peanuts, sometimes going to be um, almonds. And um, you cook it in... Um, but like a sweet dessert, kind of like a ginger broth yeah, soup, right. and um, and the tong yun symbolizes unity and um, family. You know, like everyone being healthy, and yeah, I think that's that's a good good one. Mm -hmm. to bring up in the chat. Totally. And then David also uh, brought up in the chat uh, another part of the love language. Like every time you talk to your aunt, your uncle, the first thing you always say on the phone is like, sick yeah, did, you have, did you eat yet? Did you have dinner yet? <laughs> like that, you know, that's... How are you? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Even if it's like 10 p.m., I'll, I'll call my mom like, mom, did you have dinner yet? Sick like, what did you have for dinner? She's like, obviously I ate. I'm like, it's just what we do. Okay, this is just what we ask. Okay, yeah. so... um. I wanted to ask maybe one more serious question before we kind of get to the, the food piece. Um, and this question is uh, because you guys have just deep roots, both of all of us uh, in Chinatown. Um, so Chinatown, Richmond, such hubs for our local communities. You know, what are some of the cultural changes you've seen through the years and what, what do you hope for in the future for those communities? I'm gonna start with you, Wendy. Sure. 
Yeah, actually, I would consider myself as like a, being adopted by the Chinatown community. I uh, moved to Vancouver just under six years ago. And um, yeah, I mean, even in that short time, um, it's inevitable that the landscape in Chinatown is changing really rapidly. And, um, and even though there are some really cool new things going on, um, I think seniors have shared with me over the years, just um, there's not much in Chinatown for them anymore. So I think my number one hope and desire um, to echo what some of the seniors have um, shared and advocated for over the years is just more like public spaces where they feel welcome to hang out and play mahjong with their friends or to have tea. And um, yeah, I think Chinatown historically has just a really cool um, yeah, story of welcoming people who are new, you know, so I would love to see Chinatown continue to be a place of hospitality. So um, to the greater Vancouver community, um, but definitely um, a place of hospitality for seniors. Um, yeah, I mean, COVID really just highlights, right, like the, the difficulty of social isolation and you know, I have a friend who's trying to teach uh, one of the grandmas in our group to use Zoom and we're like, yeah, sleep all pod knows how to enter the Zoom room, you know, it's like a win and it took a year yeah. to get here, you know, so I would just, um, yeah, love for uh, us to have more spaces where, um, yeah, we can make room for intergenerational and intercultural friendships and exchanges, chats, um, yeah kind of like when I chat with the grocery store people in Chinatown, but more, more space to have those kind of like serendipitous encounters and sharing life together. Absolutely. And now um, you mentioned with COVID, it just makes it even harder though, right? Uh, that's part of the concern, um, seeing more and more shuttered doors down there. It's, uh, it's certainly something that uh, we hope not to see more of in the future, but it almost feels a bit inevitable. And for Pearl and Dixon, thoughts on the future and, and what you guys want to see for Chinatown, for Richmond, or just some of the uh, Chinese community hubs around town? Yeah, I mean, I feel like that's probably the reason why I created that Chinese New Year art show event as a way to just really stay connected to that heritage. I think I was lamenting that it would be really a misfortune if it all disappeared. As, as we know, it has been rapidly declining and there's not that many um, shops left. And like the work that Wendy's doing, I think is is in the right direction of, you know, that intergenerational culture sharing while also being welcoming to all the diverse um, community that lives there now. And I would like to see, um, well, especially with Chinatown, because, you know, like growing up here since the 90s, I was that part of the uh, Hong Kong immigrant wave, I'm pretty sure, you know, like a bunch of us are too. But see how Chinatown changed over the years, not where Richmond turned into the, kind of like the new Chinatown, but it doesn't have the same vibe and it's like it's a different it's a it's a different type and i want the city or even um like the business to to encourage young entrepreneurs to go in and what i would personally love to see is a food hall in chinatown me and pearl talked about this like all the time like we this is one one thing this city lacks it's a really diverse food hall not like a food court but a food hall where you know like up and coming entrepreneurs can try out their you know um, craft and skills and have the city support and behind it and it could turn into a destination where it could revitalize Chinatown a little bit and you know like it, it it's it's sad we were in the parkade yesterday Chinatown parkade and like all the stores were closed there's one stall left that's open for um for food and that lady's been there for a while too so you know you guys can support your local Chinatown because it if not, it's gonna be gone. So yeah, that's yeah, that is basically our, our, our biggest dream for yeah. Chinatown is that sort of like second, third generation coming back and you know, being like scrappy entrepreneurs. Um, but a food hall would probably make sense mm -hmm. for us because you can chop up the spaces really small and like you know, with uh, retail space being quite you know, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Um, probably a food hall yeah. concept would make sense for yeah. I don't think you have to worry about Richmond. Richmond's like it's its own thing. Like Richmond's, <laughs> Richmond's <laughs> booming. <laughs> yeah, they're... it's like you don't have to like advocate for Richmond. They're they're in their own little world there. But I feel like you know Chinatown. If people can support. Go down and visit all. There's only a few OG 
jobs left, like your Maxims, your uh, Kane Waz, um, Boss, and um, what else, Kent's Kitchen, um, and then Jade Dynasty, and then there's some new really cool restaurants popping up left, right, and center too, and th those are really cool. So if you guys haven't been to the Chinatown in Vancouver in the past, say like two, three years, go down for a walk on a on a Sunday, and oh, and hello, new towns down there. Go get a bun. Go get yourself a bun. Go get an apple turnover, uh, Chinatown barbecue. So we we could plug all day, but head down there. And those meat buns are actually a type of dumpling. So hey, let let's come back to that dumpling. So some great thoughts there. By the way, people are loving your food hall idea. Everyone's just going off on the chat about the food hall. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's get into the dumpling portion of things. I, I think we're going to start maybe with Wendy. When are you going to do a demo? Are you guys excited? I'm so excited. I want to see. Okay, you are going to give us all of the pobo secrets uh, <laughs> for how you fold these dumpling plates and, and, and what you put in them. So I'm going to let you take it away. Yeah, um, in between me and Pearl and Dixon, hopefully we'll have time to walk you through um, making dumplings. So for the interest of time, I've already made the filling. Um, for Happy Woman Kitchen, we normally do pork and chive dumplings. Um, today I just used what I had in my fridge, which were um, napa cabbage, shiitake mushrooms, and some dried shrimp. Um, so tip number one is that you want to season this well. Um, in my opinion, or in Kong Tai's opinion, um, a good dumpling, you don't really need like too much extra sauce to go with it. You know, the filling is um, already good and you just uh, like um, flavorful enough that you just need you know a splash of vinegar to take it home so how to guarantee and can I ask you what what's the style of dumpling that you guys tend to make uh yeah I'll get onto that in a bit um okay yeah but um yeah Sorry, what Kong Tai is really adamant about is that we always cook a batch and try them out for flavor uh before we wrap like 700 of them um, and that ends up being like she makes sure that we all eat enough before we wrap for the public so definitely taste That's test your dumplings before you wrap a thousand of them um, unless you want to drown them in soy sauce later. <laughs> so that's the filling. Um, in terms of dumpling skins, um, I know some people go all the way and make their own but because we're wrapping almost a thousand we just buy the pre-made ones and um, yeah like Cantonese people tend to have like a high value for like a thinner skin, like gener generally speaking, you know, we have the saying called pei bao ham lang, which is like the skin is thin and the filling is delectable. So I just get the store-bought uh, dumpling wrappers. Um, and onto the style of dumpling. So the style of dumpling you wanna make depends on how you anticipate cooking them. So for our pop-ups in the past, we've fried our dumplings. Um, so we have tended to make this style, which I guess kind of looks like a little uh, like a curse, person. I guess. So again, yeah. why dumplings are eaten during Lunar New Year is that, you know, symbolizes like gold or a purse for all your money or stuff to go in. Traditional gold ingot, the, um, yeah, the, the exactly. little nuggets, right? And uh, why we do this is because you can see it has like a large surface area, like a large butt to fry, and then yes. it get there's more crispy surface area. And um, I think the type that Pearl and Dixon do look like this. And um, these ones are the ones that look like gold ingots and yeah, so these are good for frying, steaming too, but that's a different style. Um, so yeah, I'll just do a quick demo for us, hopefully. Um, definitely not as agile as the grandmas. So what you need is that you need your wrappers and you also need a little dish of water to moisten the edges. So yes, I've never done a Zoom demo before, so please <laughs> let me know. So you wanna- if you want, wanna Can you angle your camera down a little bit? Yeah, I was like, how do I do this without spilling meat on my laptop? So you wanna put maybe <laughs> around, um, if you're a beginner, you can put less. Um, as your skills improve, you can put more. I also didn't start with that much when I was a child, but maybe like a half a tablespoon to a tablespoon of filling in the middle. And then you wanna dab um, some water around the edges and yes, I don't think I can do this the other way around, but then maybe this will work. I start with the middle and I pinch 
and I just kind of tuck it over like this. So it's like, um, I don't know what you call it, accordion. <laughs> but and then you pinch it together, give it a good pinch yeah. so your filling doesn't um, fall out. And then you wanna put it on a lightly floured tray and just line them all up. So that's the first one. Um, and and so the dumplings that you make, are they meant to be boiled, pan fried? What do you, what's your recommended, um, you know, uh, preparation style? Yeah, so for these types, I like to fry them because there's a large surface area for it to get like nice and crispy. Um, for boiling, I, I'll do another. Would you call yours wall teep then? Would yours be considered like pot stir? Sure. Yeah, I yeah. guess so. A yeah. Type of? Yeah. But they're thinner skin, right? Than the traditional pot sticker. Yeah. I think for me growing up, we just always use these skin. So I didn't yeah. have a lot of vocabulary for it. But um, yeah, but I mean, you can always boil these too. Um, they'll taste delicious anyway. Yeah. Um, so I'll do another demo, which is uh, I think the style that Pearl and Dixon do. They can correct me if I'm wrong. So again, you want to plop the meat right in the middle. Tip, not over, do overdoing it with the fill is very key for yep. beginners because it just it always looks like not enough. But then once you start folding, you always end up with too much fill, and then yeah, uh, don't be greedy. And then it oozes don't out. Be don't be greedy. Yeah. And then they'll just ooze out and explode on you. That's the first lesson. Yeah. This is gonna make my dumplings massive because I want them one. Day. Yeah, for the pros like them, I'm sure they can put like up. a whole scoop in it. So yeah. again, you plop it right in the middle and then you fold it in half. And actually, just like this, you could technically just cook it like this too. You know, a nice crescent shape, nice and easy. Um, but it um, looks like pierogi little, style. To make the little ingot style, you put another dab of water, and you just kind of. Let your dumpling hug itself since we can't hug each other now. So we just kind of pinch that and then Perfect. Oh, beautiful. 10 out of 10. So, 10 out of 10. Do you want a job, Wendy? <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> Side hustle number 34. Um, yeah, I guess during COVID, this not only represents gold ingots, but also hugs because we can't yes. hug each other. It's true. Dumplings are hugs. Yeah. They really are. Amazing. So, okay, those are some really great tips. And we have lots of people asking the question about where to buy some of those skins. I know like uh, most of the Chinese grocers I've gone to, I usually see them. They're in the um, the fridge section. If you if you if you head in there and they just look like a little kind of pack. Yeah. Of, uh, do you have a package that we could show? There you go. Yeah, this one is from Hans, um, but there are also other brands. Um, you can definitely make your own as well if you have a lot of time at home during the pandemic. Um, but yeah, these last a while in the fridge and you can always um, freeze them as well. And the dumpling ones are circular, but they're also uh, square ones you can get for a wontons. Yep. Um, so pick your own adventure. And um, um, I'll jump into like, because one of my favorite ones to get for like um, all the home, home cooks out there, if you live in Lower Mainland, I mentioned Crystal Mall, the market downstairs, okay. The spot beside the tofu shop. That's our. That's our. <laughs> the spot beside the tofu shop, Crystal Mall, <laughs> first level. That's where you want to get your skins from uh, if you're in the in, in Lower Mainland. And also, there's um, different types out there too. I want to mention because there's the uh, Cantonese style dumplings where there's lye waters in in the dumpling wrap, so it's more yellow. It's more. Um, some some of them have egg in it. So. Get a bunch, like try, try it out. Don't, there's no right or wrong, wrong way to do it. Make your own. You know, no yeah, just wheat, pot, flour, and water and a little bit of salt. Yeah. So, and, yeah. and kind of like what Wendy was saying, right? Like your family just grew up eating it this way. You didn't really have a name for it. I think every family really has its own traditions. And very often we don't think, we don't think too, too much about it when we're, when we're mm -hmm. making them. All right. I think over to you, Pearl and Dixon, you guys are going to show us how to actually prepare mm -hmm. the dumplings. And you've got a Don't second camera set up too. Hey, second, second camera. camera. Okay. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, we can hear Thumbs you. Up. Perfect. Okay, so I got a setup right here. Um, I'm actually standing behind the camera. Um, and the most, the easiest way, there's actually a couple different ways you could do it. We're gonna do pan fried and we're gonna do steam. 
Um, I, I also like, seen it. yeah, like lazy person I am. I also like to bowl them too, but uh, I think these two are the most easy appealing. So um, these demons- It's not lazy. It preserves the taste of the, the dumpling, okay? <laughs> For all of us who are just boiling our dumplings. Okay? I love boiling them, but um, I think the, the presentation though with the steaming and the pan frying is um, a little bit easier. And uh, as kind of home cooks, you know, um, I do champion nonstick pans because you don't have to deal with like boring to burn um, and just go medium, medium high heat. So what I've got going on here, these steamers you could um, get from a local TNT or a Chinese market, pretty easy. And um, what I really like to is getting these steamer papers, right? So these ones you can also get in a TNT. Um, there's a spot in Richmond if you're um, in the lower mainland, call, um, it's like a tiny supermarket. They have all different sizes in there. Or if you can't get these, basically they're just parchment paper holes. So remember that skill you learned in grade school where you cut paper in the holes? <laughs> that's what- Makes snowflakes. <laughs> pretty much, so that's what it is. So you can use parchment paper, cut some holes into it. And um, so yeah, now, I we also have, love all these obscure places that you go to to go and buy all your all your tools and your, your secrets goods. in Chinatown. Next to, the, next to the tofu shop. Next to the tofu shop. Because there's three different spots in Crystal Mall that sells dumpling skin and we tried all of them. We did our research and the spot beside the tofu shop's best. So there, yeah. there you and go. The yeah. And the tofu shop's great. Saturday, Sundays, you go get the tofu pudding there. They have it hot out. Um, okay, so oh, I'm gonna, yeah. so the water is okay. going already. As you can see, I got the steamer paper in there, and pretty much you want the um, pretty much roaring like um, the water in the pot. So we're gonna do a seamless plug right here, and we're gonna go with the original pork and chai flavor of, of the Vicky stuff. And, and so, what flavors it. do you sell of dumplings? So we have the original, obviously the um, pork and chives, and then we have a shrimp scallop and cilantro. We also have a vegetarian one that's uh, technically vegan. And we also have a chicken ginger, which is um, one of my favorites. So, yeah. And then we're yeah, going to do... Yeah. Let's see. And you got, um, your, your style is considered a, a Shanghainese style dumpling, yes, right? right? So it's like this. So why we chose one of doing this style? Actually, the first time, little little side story, when we did the dumplings for um, Pearl's art show, we did the yoga style. The pot sticker mm -hmm. style, the plated style. And mm -hmm. what we found is after the fact that is this shape actually holds sauce and um, garnish very, very well. It doesn't slide off, it actually catches it. So that's why we settled on this shape. Um, yeah, I can so see that. Luck, yeah. We're gonna put eight in here, right? And you got one in the middle and pretty much that's eight, right? Yep, cover it. And this will steam for the um, meat ones 10, 10 minutes, 10 to 11 minutes. And because, you know, the fill is raw, so you do definitely want to check for uh, food safety. But usually 10 to 12 minutes, they're going to be cooked. Now we're going to demo the uh, pan fry, all right? So turn this on and go medium high heat. Get the pan going. And we get some oil in there and pretty much I would say like one tablespoon, one and a half tablespoon. And there's different ways of doing this, but this is my way. And put frozen dumplings directly. And if it's fresh dumplings like Wendy's making, you actually don't need to cook it for as long. But for frozen, which, you know, um, a lot of people usually have the freezer, you could go frozen directly into the pan. And what I like to do is like we our bottom flat too where you could lay it out and it'll sit flat. Make sure there's a little bit of oil touching. And we're also gonna do eight in here too. So the chat, uh, there's uh, lots of chatter going on about gluten-free skins. Um, yes. And I call them skins. I guess they're actually called wrappers. I call them skins because in Chinese it's pay. So it's like, that's like my, my even though English is my first language, that's the translation there though. So for the wrappers, do you, are they gluten-free? Do you guys ever do gluten-free ones? Have you heard of gluten-free ones? 
Actually, and when you go dim sum, when you get hagao, which is like the shrimp dumplings, when you see mm-hmm. the little trans or fun gao, which is, um, I guess, has like a uh, dumpling with vegetables. So the kind of translucent skin, mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure that oh, wow. that is made with yeah. um, rice flour, I believe. I personally have had not experienced making gluten-free wrappers because without the gluten, it just um, falls apart really yeah, easily. Okay. So, yeah, I have no wisdom to shed. Okay, I'm going to jump in quickly and we're going to get back to the gluten-free thing, right? So pretty much yeah. once you got your oil going, it's medium, medium high. You want to pour some water into the pan and how you usually gauge it is maybe coming up to one quarter of the height of the dumplings because different size pans hold different water but a way to good way to gauge it one quarter of the height of the dumpling that's how much water it should be have and what you want to do is grab your lid and it's covered and let it sit don't touch it so for this what you want to do three four minutes in you want to check how much water has evaporated and from there we'll kind of uh, move on to the next step. So while these are cooking, we can get back to the gluten-free skin questions. Oh, we have other question now. This is okay. a good question. Um, hang on, I should open the Q&A as well. Oh, I think this is, this, this is a good question. So Sarah asks, um, my pork dumplings never taste as good as the one as my mainland Chinese auntie makes, what am I missing or doing wrong? And someone, Karen also asked, what are some recommendations for how to season the dumpling filling? So I think um, taste wise, what do you guys think need to go into a dumpling in order for them to taste delicious? Um, do you want to speak first or do you want me to, to speak first? Why don't you go first, Dixon? Okay, so one of the key things that I've learned with um, say like working with pork, for example, right? You do want to add a, a little bit of sugar to balance it out. You do want sesame oil. That's a very key thing. White pepper. That's another very key one. Um, if you are down with the MSG, throw in a sprinkle of MSG. Got salt. Um, what else, Pearl? Yeah, and then, oh, using herbs too. So that's why chives work so well with pork because chives itself is very like strong, right? It's a pretty strong herb. Mm -hmm. So combine that with pork is, it's a match made in heaven. Also, when you're actually doing the fill, the key thing is to getting, you know how sometimes when you get a dumpling, you you bite into it, the meat kind of comes apart, even the ground ground pork comes apart. That's because it wasn't um, either stirred long enough or like thrown, like you, you know, you work it into a ball and you keep like slapping it into back into the bowl, I usually at least do it 20 to 30 times. And that'll create like, um, it, yeah, it binds it. And then when you cook the dumpling, it comes out like the bite is way better. So that's- Oh, a tip. that's a good secret. That's a good tip. Don't be afraid to get your hands dirty and wear gloves if you need to, but- Yes. A wooden spoon okay. just doesn't really do the trick. So you really gotta get in there and- So true. Yeah. Okay. I also like to add um, cooking wine, like Shaoxing wine. Mm-hmm. Doing Dao is a good one. And um, yeah, in terms of like what Dickie mentioned in terms of like your flavor boosters. So things like dried shiitake mushrooms or dried shrimp. Um, you know, those are the things that already have like a lot of natural umami. So mm-hmm. adding some of that also helps. Um, fat is also flavor. So sometimes if um, the pork or chicken or beef, you know, whatever, um, I guess, especially with vegetarian dumplings, like you need a little bit more fat to add to it. So I usually just drizzle in canola oil. Um, if it's like not uh, like if it's too lean, um, today I was rendering some chicken fat for something else I was making. So I drizzled some of that in. Um, yeah. And I guess, yeah, what did he mention in terms of sesame oil that would help, um, both add flavor and fat which is also flavor. Yes, fat is indeed flavor, I know. All the things that taste good are always bad for you, right? Except dumplings. I like to, I reckon that dumplings are generally good for you. Um, So another interesting question. Uh, Oh yes, this one uh, was just uh, someone who's watching the cooking process. Dixon, uh, can you explain how steaming works? I think we have some beginners with us. I'm with you, buddy. If you're a beginner, I'm a beginner too with cooking. So what have you got there? 
So pretty much this setup right here is uh, usually what most uh, Asian or Chinese households will have. Basically, this is a wok. And then I get the steamer and then you just fill the wok bottom with the water and the steamer just kind of sits in. So you guys get the right size steamer um, for your wok. But there are um, products out there right now where it's an integrated steamer that you could get. So you could always get, just get that. We just have this because, you know, it's easy. Um, it, it's not like one clean thing if I'm, you know, balling. Then there's like a new set that I've seen out there where everything's like super nice and fancy. Um, so that's a setup. Uh, basically, all you need is a wok and then a steamer and different sizes. This is a 12 inch, I believe. That we we got but they come in you know all, all sizes like eight inch 10 inch so yeah great uh yes, do yes. you prefer you a bamboo steamer to you... a steam, stainless steel steamer Take, um i like the flavor of the bamboo steamer that comes out you know like it, the house smells nice after the bamboo and mm. um but you could use a stainless steamer just put the parchment paper or that steamer paper on so for now let me i'm going to open up the frying pan and see so now you can see most of the water has evaporated, right? So yeah. what happened with the um, with the lid, lid on, it's actually steaming and it's pan frying at the same time. So I'm gonna set this aside over here. The so steaming is nice because you could just leave it and you don't have to feel that. And I'm just gonna check the bottom right here and see how we're doing. Um, Do you have that beautiful lace under there? Uh, okay, so you want to get the, into the lace. That's actually an extra step. And it's basically oh, okay. cornstarch water um, oh. that you kind of pour in close to the end and it creates like a crisp. So you oh. actually can do that. But that that's like, like, that's like next level. That's not like dumpling error. 101. That's like 201. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> next soon. So now this yeah. is cooking. And let the bottom brown. You can turn the heat down to medium and just let it cook and let it crisp up and just check it every now and then. You, you can see now like it's starting to brown, right? Can you see the bottom of this one right here? Right. Uh, let me turn it this way, starting to brown, yep, right? Yeah, So we can just leave it and let that cook over medium hit, heat, let that, um, and now's a good time to actually get some of your garnishes going. So what I have today, ready? We got some green onions right here, right? Chopped up, fine chopped. We've got some cilantro over here. That's also fine chopped. Um, our household likes to eat heat. So we got some uh, bird's eye chili, fine chopped also. And then one of the most asked questions from us is what kind of sauces should, should we get? Well, that's actually up to really up to personal preference, but your standard um, sauce or your standard, every pantry should have the following items, right? Number one, sesame oil. And you have to get the Asian kind, right? The Japanese or the Chinese toasted sesame oil. Okay. Mm -hmm. Soy sauce. Everybody has soy sauce, right? So there's, um, I prefer like the lighter premium um, from Lee Kum Kee, okay? But any type of sauce, soy sauce work. And there's a difference between light and dark soy sauce yeah, when you're talking about soy sauce, sauce to a Chinese person. Hunt, yep, so get the light soy sauce. You'll be, you'll be fine, you'll be safe. And then there's also the black vinegar, it's called the Ching Kang vinegar. Um, you could also use balsamic too, you know, there's no right or wrong way to do it, like freestyle. And then we have um, some sort of chili oil, right? This is um, Zhao chili oil. This is Pearl's favorite. It actually got a bit Ooh. of kick to it. Actually got quite a bit of kick to it. But I'm sure a lot of you know about um, the grandma's brand, right? I was gonna say, where's Lao Gamma? Lao Gamma, well, we moved on from Lao Gamma. <laughs> We made her. Okay, know. so this is an so oh this is, okay. So this is a five spice chili oil that we we made, and uh, these are all the sauces that you can have in your pantry. And pretty much when it's ready, you mix them together. I would just go one one tablespoon per one to one, and that will have a pretty nice um, flavor to it. So now, okay, you see this right here? These are pretty much done. We got the perfectly brown. And then, excuse my chopstick skills over here. Delicious. Smells delicious. Guess what we're having for dinner later, right? You have all the bottoms brown perfectly. And these are pretty much done. So top to bottom, maybe like 10, another 10 minutes. And that also means our, these ones are also good to go too. So if you 
want to check also for some of the people that are first time dumpling cookers, you can also take one of these meat thermometers and just poke it in the ah. middle. It registers over um, 165, 169. Let's go 169 for um, pork. That means they're cooked. But know the fact that you might leak some of the juices out and nobody want any any dumpling juice leaking out because that's the best part of the dumpling. And basically, that's, that's, a, good, it. Uh, that's so a good tip. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I said that's a good tip to actually just use the meat thermometer if you have yeah. to. You can you sacrifice one, one dumpling. <laughs> exactly. Just poke one of them and you can see if they're ready. But generally, cooking dumplings shouldn't take any more than 15 minutes max okay. for all, all styles, whether it's pan frying or steaming. And um, I'll kind of whip some sauces and then I'll plate the dumplings for you guys. And then Okay. I, so... Uh, yeah, I just wanted to get a sense of your plan, Dickie. So you're gonna actually just now plate them up so we can see what your final sauce looks like, right? Yes. I'm yep. just cognizant of the time. Okay, I'm just gonna yeah, we, pop yeah, into the Q&A. Uh, maybe, I think we've got about maybe five more minutes. Okay, perfect. Okay. Ah, this is another uh, good question. So um, what about filling for a vegetarian dumpling? Wendy, what would, would you do? Yeah, um, Kong Tai also makes vegetarian dumplings for um, Chinatown volunteers who are vegetarian and she usually puts um, like firm tofu. Uh, actually, she changes up every time. So I'll just list the things I've seen her put in. Firm tofu, um, you can also stir fry a bit of like scramble, a bit of egg. Um, shiitake mushrooms, definitely. Those are your umami bombs and um, you can also put in a little vermicelli actually um, and definitely vegetables of your choice. Um, yeah, I guess this would be especially important for veg vegetarian dumplings, but another reason why your dumpling filling might get diluted is because of water coming out of your vegetables. So if you use, chives are usually fine because they're pretty dry, but if you're using something like Napa cabbage or even like zucchini or bok choy, you definitely want to finely chop them up, um, sprinkle on some salt and let it sit for 20, 30 minutes, and then really like squeeze out the water with your hands. So that will prevent you from getting like a sad and soggy filling. So if you're making a vegetarian one, you're probably putting in a lot of vegetables. So definitely do that. All right, great tips. And so uh, Dixon, another question yes. for you. Uh, when you mentioned adding sugar to your dumpling, do you just Ooh. use regular white sugar or, or uh, is there is there like, like a specific sugar that you like to use? I think for pork, uh, brown sugar would be a nice um, uh, addition to it. So uh, we usually use brown sugar, but like we go fairly light on it because we don't want the dumpling to be sweet, right? So right. Yeah. But it really does bring out the, the flavor of the, the meatiness in there. It's very nice. Okay. All right, so, Ricky, that was a, an answer for you. All right. How can, can anyone see over here? I'm going to work. So basically, I'm going to um, get some cilantro, a little okay. sprinkle on top, and then see, yeah, like, like I said, our shape. It catches all the little um, little pieces and bits, all right? And then we're gonna do a little bit of green onions on there. Looking good. So, Wendy, how do you usually season your dumplings? Um, um for the at the end, do you just do the vinegar at the end? Yeah, I definitely love the chinkang vinegar. It has just a nice um aroma to it. I also usually make chili oil um, and put some on top. Um, yeah, and if I feel like it, some of the cilantro green onions too. Um, yeah, cool. And so Dixon, gonna, how are we doing over there? Yeah, we're going to do one tablespoon of soy. And then we could do one tablespoon of sesame oil. And so you kind of put your fresh ingredients, you just topped it right on top of the chili, yes. the, the scallions, and the cilantro. But then now you're taking the, the wet sauces and you're mixing in a separate bowl. Yes. And okay. what I also like to is to do a final kind of drizzle with the chili oil. Just over okay. it. And that's if people eat spicy. You know, if you don't eat spicy, you could skip all of this. And then get some. 
I guess for folks who don't eat spice, you can put like garlic oil. That's yes, garlic oil would be a good one. Um, and and then, I think some people when they do soy gao, they use like raw garlic with it too. So raw garlic and I so think many soy, ways. Yeah, the, the vinegar that's the, the that make them, like a little bit of acid, and basically that's it. So this is just how you know we do it. You can sprinkle um, sesame seeds on there, toast the sesame seeds. You can sprinkle uh, actually, you know what, pearl sprinkle shredded cheese on them the other day and they were delicious <laughs> my unconventional method so don't feel like you know you have okay to. you you're not crazy pearl because today i actually got a pitch from um the uh, parmigiano reggiano consortium that pitched me on dumplings for lunar new year with parmigiano reggiano so there wow. you go probably super delicious actually one of my favorite ways of frying dumplings not i don't do it all the time but um i Kind of so when you add the water, the step where Dickie demonstrated, I like to put some grated cheese around it and it kind of melts with the water and then you just kind of let it um, dry off a little bit and you get like a crunchy cheese skirt, like a frico texture Ooh. on top. So when I'm feeling extra and I need comfort food from many cultures, I, I do that. So Nobody's crazy in this conversation. Nobody is crazy in dumpling world. It is all welcome. Do you know what and I so, want to try next, Leanne? I want to do yeah. a dumpling cheese fondue. Oh, that Think would be it. so good. Mm -hmm. It would be guilty delicious. Right? That looks amazing, Dickie. There you go. So super easy. Um, tell us one more time what was in your sauces and all of the toppings you put on just for everyone. I think people are taking notes. Okay, so um, let me grab the bottles so you guys can see what they look like. Mm -hmm. So the garnishes on top right now is chopped up cilantro, green onion, and uh, a little bit of uh, bird's eye chili. And then he drizzled a bit of the chili oil on top, right. the five spice chili oil. Yep. That's um, ours, yep. And then, so these are the sauces. This is the um, vinegar, so Ching Kong vinegar. It's, it's a black big, vinegar. It's a black vinegar, basically. If you can't find this, balsamic works, or the red vinegar works, and then a light soy. Except the brown one's a little like more caramelly yeah. kind of toasty flavor, yes. so it's nice. And a little bit of balanced. smokiness to it, yeah. Yeah, yeah and it's not as kind of like um, pungent or, or like grippy as the red one. Right. And then we just have a sesame oil that's in our, um, we like the Japanese brands for sesame oil. Let's make sure it's a toasted sesame oil. Toasted sesame oil, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then um, chili oil. So this is the brand that we use. This is called a Gunye Kwage, okay? And it's a Chiu Chow style chili oil. So we got kick to it. But the one with the um, Lao Gan Ma, that one everybody knows, that one's a good one too. So, yeah. Awesome. And that's like well, a base, you know, please um, be adventurous. Please explore, add cheese, add cheese you know? Um, Maybe like sour cream, like treat it like yeah. pierogies. Who, who, like it doesn't matter, right? Like get creative with it. So anything goes. Well, I think that's it. Thank you so much. Everyone is uh, wishing this was 4D um, because <laughs> those dumplings look amazing, Dickie. And over to you, Wendy, as well. Those are beautiful dumplings. How are you going to cook them up tonight, Wendy? Are you going to cook them up tonight or is this for later? Yes. <gasps> look how many she's wrapped. Oh. Wow. I'm going to eat some of them fried and uh, cook some up for the New Year meal tomorrow I'm doing as well. Awesome. Amazing. Well, wishing uh, the three of you and as well as all of our attendees a very happy Chinese New Year. Happy Lunar New Year. I learned that from my mom. Yesterday, wow. so. Silent. <laughs> so good. And everybody, sun tiger home too. Yes, right? yes, so yes. super important. Most, right? Yes, most important for this year as we uh, as we uh, try to ride it out in COVID times. Okay, yes. I'm going to turn it back over to you, Candy. Thank you, everyone. It was wonderful being a part of this. Thanks so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you all so much for joining us on this super fun, fabulous evening tonight. Uh, and thank you, Leanne, so much for taking time out from your baby duties. We really appreciate it. Uh, Wendy from Happy Woman Kitchen, please say hi to the Popos for me. And also uh, Dixon and Pearl from Dickie Dumps. Thank you so much for joining us. 
and for keeping everything moving along so smoothly tonight. That was amazing. I, everybody was just loving it in the chat. So we are so happy that you uh, joined us at the library today. Um, I'd also like to give a big shout out to my colleagues that are helping out with the event tonight. Uh, Diane, Jorge, and Ida are all in the background making sure that the chat runs smoothly, the uh, cameras are in the right spots, and everything is moving along. Um, so one other, a couple other notes uh, just to end it off tonight, just so you know that all the branches of the Vancouver Public Library are open now with the exception of Oak Ridge. Uh, you can browse materials, use the computers, check out holds, and ask questions. Masks are now mandatory when you come into the library for the safety of everyone. Check out vpl.ca slash events for our upcoming events and our main website for library updates or to browse the collection at vpl.ca. Happy Lunar New Year, everyone, and have a great rest of your evening. And please keep safe out there. We hope to see you again soon. Bye. Thank you, guys.